one of the uh, most difficult points to get across, probably the single most difficult point in all of monetary analysis and monetary economics, is that the banks create money supply out of, out of thin air. Since everybody's been inured to thinking that um, the banks really simply borrow our money and re-lend it, it's very difficult to make the mind shift and realize that the banks are really engaging in a species of in a form of legalized counterfeiting, in other words, creating new money out of thin air, without having to uh, sell goods and services. I mean, because usually on the market, the way to acquire money is to sell goods and services in exchange for it, or else uh, convince people, I was just going to say con people, <laughs> convince people into contributing money to your organization of some sort. Uh, in other words, either donation or purchasing of goods and services. Also on the market, the only other way to get money is to dig it out of the ground, or to dig the gold out of the ground, which is also for a hassle. Another way, of course, of getting money, uh, getting income, acquiring money, is the governmental way of stealing it, in other words, through taxation. Well, of course, you won't get a chance to analyze taxation in depth in these lectures. This is not part of basic economics. Basic economics really covering the market and interferences, various forms of interferences uh, in it, uh, rather than complete aberrations like taxation. Another way of acquiring money is to print it or create it out of thin air by some kind of prestidigitation. digitation. The major single lesson of the analysis of banking is this is what the banks do, this is what the commercial banks do. This is what so-called, it's known euphemistically as fractional reserve banking. Certain coin collectors sell coins to people and keep them for their clients as a service and then lend the money out or don't keep them or don't have really the money there. This is a form of fractional reserve banking. Creating fictitious claims or another way of putting it is a form of embezzlement. I use a harsher but I still think accurate term. Because it's really equivalent to the old movies of the 30s. The old movies of the 30s, when you have a, a typical bank manager, and the bank manager is stunned with some of the funds, but not to have stunned permanently. He has a great tip on a race, so it's a sure bet on the sixth aqueduct or whatever. He's going to take this money, even though it's not his money, he's going to invest it in the tip, and it's a sure win, and, therefore, and then he'll be able to put the money back and pocket the interest, the pocket the, the gain, before the bank examiner comes. And usually what happens is, of course, the bank examiner shows up unexpectedly early in a nice court and goes to jail. But the point is, even if that doesn't happen, he's still a crook. It doesn't make any difference whether he's caught. Crookery is objective rather than whether a function of whether he's caught or not. In the case of the bank, is you have a very similar situation. The bank feels, usually correctly, of course, that they'll be, they're able to, to issue one form or another of uncovered bank notes or uncovered bank deposits or, looking another way, fake warehouse receipts. They'll issue them because they know darn well, through uh, experience on the market, through statistical experience or whatever, that not everybody's going to call for it because people have trust this bank and they think their money is there. And, and so they're, a, they're able to get away with it for some time. My contention, however, is that it's really a form of embezzlement, uh, this issue of uncovered banknotes or fake warehouse receipts. Because usually if you have a warehouse receipt, there's supposed to be something behind it. If you have a certificate saying that we will redeem your 10,000 bushels of wheat at any time you ask for it, there's supposed to be 10,000 bushels of wheat there. It's not supposed to be a hot air kind of uh, receipt. But this is what the banks do. There's this division of opinion within the uh, sound money movement, when we put it that way, about fractional reserve banking. Some of us think that fractional reserve banking should be illegal as being fraudulent, on the same basis as any other sort of fraud or embezzlement. Others believe that this is not fraud or embezzlement and it should not be illegal. They should be able to do this until the actual bankruptcy appears, until, in other words, the people claim their money and, and don't find it. I'm in the pro-fraud camp. In other words, the, the camp that says that this is fraud should be outlawed. Even if, even if we assume this is legal, which, of course, it has been for many years, several centuries. Even if we assume that fractional reserve banking is legal, even allowing this, there is in the market certain severe checks, certain severe limitations on the degree to which the banks can expand money out of the thin air. And we now examine these limitations under a system of so-called free banking, free banking being defined technically as a system where the banks are allowed to engage in fractional reserve banking, are allowed to create money out of thin air, but, of course, have to pay up People come and present the warehouse receipt. Obviously, that's a key. I mean, nobody can deny it's an open contract promising to redeem it. And free banking is a situation where the banks are, have to redeem their pledge to pay up when the bank deposit or the bank note is presented to them. On the other hand, are allowed to engage in what I consider fraud, but other people consider not fraud. In this situation, in the situation of free banking, we would have a very hard money situation. We would not have too much bank credit expansion. But there are three kinds of checks in the free market on this kind of activity. One check or one limitation on bank credit expansion in the free market is if the people just don't use bank credit. People don't trust the banks, they think they're a bunch of crooks, and they don't use it. Now, this is a very healthy situation. 
In most so-called primitive countries, it still exists. People don't use banks. People worry about them. They feel something crooked about the whole thing, and they're absolutely right. And so they don't use it. They don't accept bank credit. If you don't accept bank credit, if you're a seller or a lender or something, you don't accept bank credit or bank deposit, well, and you don't accept the check, you tear it up and you throw it in the guy's face. Then the, the bank can't expand credit because nobody will accept it. It's like me printing a hundred Roth bars and trying to buy something with it. It would not get a good reception among the, the tradesmen of the neighborhood. <laughs> check. As a matter of fact, uh, people do not get paid in checks. I mean, workers didn't get paid in checks until very recently, really until World War II. Before World War II, workers got paid in cash and paper money, treasury. Most people didn't have bank accounts. The whole idea of bank accounts is people were wary of, and correctly so. The whole idea of everybody having a, che a checking account only comes in after World War II. I think in Europe, workers still get paid in, in, in cash, at least until very recently. Banks only come in on a big scale fairly, fairly recently. They start, of course, with merchants and with uh, industrialists, etc. The average person did not have a checking account until quite late. Of course, the sort of the monetary establishment, the government and its allies and minions are trying to push the idea of banking all over the place. They push the cultural idea that it's silly and primitive and Neanderthal if anybody can distrust the bank. There used to be movies again in the 30s when the old geezer, the inevitable old geezer has his money under the floorboards in the form of gold or cash or something, you know, and refuses to use the bank, distrust it, claims that the banks are fraudulent, and everybody laughs at him. Only intellectual <laughs> liberals and solid citizens of the town laugh at him. Of course, he was right, and metaphysically at least. That's the sort of culture that gets spread around. Silly not to put your money in a bank. Banks are really great. They're advanced. They're progressive. They're civilized. And anybody who doesn't do that is really sort of the same status in Kuwaiti nomad. But of course, they were really right, as in we were wrong. And as a matter of fact, the Ethiopian natives and the Kuwaiti natives, not only don't they accept bank credit, they don't accept paper money either. They don't accept even their own beloved government's paper. They don't accept any of this stuff. They accept only gold and sometimes silver. As a result of which, these countries cannot inflate. They can't have runaway inflation because, they, because nobody will accept the stuff that they're printing. It's a beautiful and healthy situation. I commend it to the American citizenry. <laughs> okay, so that's one check on the bank. But of course, this check is faded out. It's faded out under government cultural uh, pressure, fading away of sound money ideas in the minds of the public and so forth and so on. As a matter of fact, when in, in, even in the 1820s and 1830s, when people, when money first got printed, when paper money first comes in a large scale in America, in those days, they made paper money out of rags. It was very high quality paper. Uh, rag paper, now of course, is much uh, cheaper paper. At any rate, uh, they made it out of rag paper, and the hard money people would write in the newspapers, and they'd say, don't accept rag paper, it's filthy rag money. You know, the only really good money is good, sound, shiny gold. And so there's a lot of healthy attack, even as late as that. But as time goes on, they say that people get brainwashed into the idea that it's much more civilized to have, to have bank credit and paper. Okay, so that check, that limitation has, has more or less faded out, except in the so-called primitive countries. The second limitation, which is my particular favorite, sort of God's angry man, the wrath of God type of thing, and the second choice, second limitation. Unfortunately, most people don't see it that way, and those of us who favor bank runs, as, as they are called, consider hard-hearted monsters. I have a, a certain love for the bank run. The bank run is a situation where you have, the bank has cash or gold or whatever, let's say cash out, including the gold and paper. Let's say cash is $1,000, the man deposits or bank notes $5,000, IOUs $4,000. This is known as fractional reserve banking, 20% reserves. The reserve to meet the demand deposit. $5,000 is outstanding out there in the field, so to speak. It should be redeemed at any time. People want to redeem it. And the bank has $1,000 in their till to pay off. The other $4,000 is out there making profits for the bank out of, this, out of the demand depositor's money. Uh, they making profits out of other guys' money. The bank run occurs when the clients of the bank, and the people who have already accepted the bank, are either accepting their, the bank's notes or demand deposits, lose confidence in the bank. For some reason, feel the bank is really bankrupt. In other words, they read more of my stuff. <laughs> I think there was a law, I can't swear to this, but I think there's a law on the books right now, a federal statute, that it's illegal to spread false rumors about the monetary health of a bank. It's illegal to spread false rumors about a bank being inherently bankrupt. Now, nobody spreads rumors about General Motors being bankrupt. Obviously, they're not bankrupt. For any other business than a bank, in the asset column and the liability column, every business knows they have certain accounts payable. In other words, if certain liabilities are due, say, uh, here's a corporation that has a million dollars due in six months. So they make darn sure that six months from now, they'll have a million dollars coming in, so they'll be able to pay it. So this is known as keeping their, the time structure of their assets Proportion of the time structure of liabilities, even better. In other words, if your liabilities 
are coming in to pay up something in a year, you try, before a year is up, you try to get the money in. So the, the, you try to keep your time structured, your assets. So all corporations do this and all businesses do this. You've taught this in every management course. Only with a commercial bank. Not only don't they do it, but they can't do it because their, their liabilities are immediate. Their time structure is right now. And their assets, of course, can't be immediate. They wouldn't be making any money on it. It'd be 100% reserve bank instead of fractional reserve bank. So their assets are coming in, you know, six months, a year, two years, whatever it is, and their, their demand, their liabilities are right now. So therefore, a bank is inherently bankrupt. A bank run occurs when the people begin to realize, the clients begin to realize that the bank is inherently bankrupt. They better get their money out fast, because since the bank only has a thousand bucks, you know, five thousand bucks outstanding, you better be the first thousand to get it, otherwise you're not going to get anything at all. When this deep knowledge uh, hits the consciousness of the, of the public, a bank run occurs, and it's a beautiful thing to, to watch. It's just as triumphant. One of the reasons why it's especially illegal to spread false rumors about the inherent bankruptcy of a bank is because I'm really in a state of illegality right now, because I'm saying all these banks are really uh, bankrupt. For me to prove the case, in other words, it's really a first infringement of free speech for making this statement illegal. Now, if they took me to court and said it's illegal, you're spreading false rumors about the bankruptcy of the American banking system, I would say, no, no, it's not false because they're inherently bankrupt. And they would come up with their establishment monetary theories claiming that the bank is not inherently bankrupt. And the judge would have to decide on the basis of high monetary theory, <laughs> in which he's not very well equipped, so, at least. so the, the stacks are loaded against you. So the, when the public finds out, the knowledge floods into their consciousness, their brain, that this damn bank in which they've uh, invested their life savings is bankrupt, then the run begins. Again, they, I go back to the movies in the 1930s, Classic movies about bank runs, usually the Depression, and suddenly the rumor spreads that the bank is unsound, that, that they're losing money or whatever, they haven't got the money which people think they've got, and then people start flooding into the bank, I don't want to get my money out. And they line up about five, six in the morning when the bank doors are open, you have these lines around the block, and so each person goes up to the teller and demands his money. The bank president or vice president is telling these people, it's, these are false, rum wicked rumors spread by communists and Bolsheviks. The bank is sound, and don't worry about it. He's lying through his teeth, obviously. They have now seen through his prevarications, and insisted on their money, and of course the bank folds very quickly, maybe in a couple of hours. And many of the bank that has folded in this kind of situation, during the Great Depression of 1929 to 33, there were thousands of bank runs, the banks collapsing. This, of course, is a beautiful check, a beautiful limitation, free market limitation on bank credit expansion, because the banks know down deep in their heart if the ratio gets too low, people like myself will start spreading rumors, other people will start believing it, and they'll start calling for their money, and the whole tissue of cards will collapse, because it has to collapse. Once people realize what's going on, it's got to collapse, because they ain't got no money. In American economic history, even among American economic historians, there's a great myth of, of so-called wildcat banking. We hear that before 1913 or before 1865, banking was free in the United States, and it was wildcat. It was runaway inflation, it was chaotic total chaos prevailed. Well, that's not quite true. On the other hand, the defenders of wildcat banking claim is really great because inflation is important for economic development. That's even less true. Certainly, <laughs> the reason why they were called cool wildcat banking, here's the Rothbard Bank. I've got no money at all, no cash. I issue $20,000 in Rothbard dollars with, you know, it says dollar, redeemable in gold, you know, whatever. And here's the $20,000 bills and that sort of stuff. I haven't got anything. I've got nothing. I got peanuts. First of all, why will people accept the money? Let's say they accept it. In the first place, I'm doing great as long as they accept it. I'm spending the money, I'm lending it to my brother-in-law, whatever it is, and everything's going great. The only problem is what happens when people try to redeem it? People will redeem it, of course, I won't have any money, I'll go bankrupt. The whole beautiful bubble will, will have burst. The wildcat thing came from this. The idea is to make your headquarters inaccessible. If your headquarters of the bank offices are in New York City, Fifth Avenue, 42nd Street, they'll find you very quickly and you go bankrupt fast before you can print and spend this new money. If, however, you're up in the wilds of what was then northern Michigan, Michigan was all forest and jungle and all that in those days. If you're up there in the wilds with no roads getting up there, with only wildcats around you and no people, then it takes months before the, the person can schlep his way to like, your bank headquarters and demand redemption. That's why they were called wildcat banks. These guys would sandwich themselves in the wolf in the woods and would take days of backpacking to get there. So that was unfortunate. I think I say I think all these banks were fraudulent, but there was still a market check on them for this reason. First place, nobody really except I established the Rothbard Bank up in northern Michigan. The sophisticated people in New York and Philadelphia, etc., wouldn't accept it. Well, they accepted a very huge, a huge discount. In other words, one Rothbard dollar 
or the Rothbard Bank of Michigan would go for 10 cents in New York. They would depreciate very rapidly, and all banks and all large merchants had weekly tables which would come out listing the bank discount rate on the market. Rothbard Bank would keep depreciating very rapidly and finally go out of existence. So there was a market check in that sense. Secondly, they would circulate really at par right around northern Michigan, I mean, right around wildcat country. As soon as you got a little bit further from that, they would depreciate. So that was, that was sort of a natural check even there on the wildcat activities. The other big thing is that the reason why there was wildcat banking to the extent there was, it wasn't because of free banking. It was because every time the banks got into trouble, every single time in American history, the banks got into trouble on any kind of large scale, the government stepped in, state and federal government stepped in, and allowed them to continue operations without paying up. In other words, when a bank run occurs, and people call upon, all right, pay up banks, the government steps in and says, you don't have to pay up. This, is, this used to be called suspension of specie payment, which is a very highfalutin name for allowing for a monstrous situation where you're allowing the, guy not to, the bank not to pay up, but at the same time the bank continues operations, continues printing new money, continues being able to force their own debtors, the guys who, who borrow money from the banks, they, they're still forced to pay money to the banks, but the banks themselves are now exempt from any payment. They're completely cut off from the legal contractual obligation to redeem their money. Now, in this situation has occurred in every depression in American history. It started, well, the first banks on a massive scale really began in the War of 1812. Before that, there were very few banks. Well, they didn't amount to hell of beans. The War of 1812 was a very unpopular war. It was it was fought uh, essentially by the Western states. The New England states, which had most of the money, most of the capital, etc., were against the war, so they couldn't borrow from New England capitalists. So the way the government financed the war effort was essentially by encouraging new banks to come in with no money, sort of like Rothbard banks, and they would they print a lot of money and lend it to the government, buy government bonds, and the government would take the money and spend it. Now, unfortunately for the government, they had to spend it on manufactured products, munitions, etc., in New England, because New England was the center of most of the manufacturing, so the the money found its way to the New England banks, who are non-exflationary banks. New England banks then call upon the upstart Pennsylvania and Kentucky banks for redemption. They didn't have the money, and then what was going to happen? They're going to go bankrupt. The federal government couldn't afford that because the whole war effort was being financed by these guys. In the black day of August, August 1814, the government issued a special specie payment as a wartime emergency measure, allowed the banks to continue operation, and new banks to come in without paying anything. They had to pay a nickel. This suspension of specie payment continued long after the war was over. The war was over in February 1815. The suspension was allowed to continue until approximately March 1817. In other words, for two and a half years, we had a banking situation where not only were the banks permitted to engage in fractional reserve wildcat banking, they didn't have to pay up. They, had, they could force their own debtors to pay up. They didn't have to pay a nickel. It was an unbelievable situation. There were then two schools of thought on how to solve this question. The minority school of thought, headed by my, one of my own particular favorites in American history, John Randolph of Roanoke, marvelous old geezer, and Daniel Webster, who at that time happened to be pretty good on the question, kept changing his position in accordance with who bought him at the moment. At any rate, he was <laughs> some good guy bought him at this point. So Webster and Randolph gave great speeches in Congress saying, the only way to cure this is to you know, force the banks to pay up. If they don't pay up, they're bankrupt. Let's all smash them. And then you return it with sound specie currency. But instead of that, the government took the easy way, and they set up a central bank for the first time, the first bank, well, second bank in the United States, I should say, second central bank, to pump more money to the system to allow the banks to return the specie payments, in other words, to pay them off, so to speak, and pump more money to the system so the banks could then use the central bank notes as money. And this allowed the inflation not only to continue, but to even expand after that and caused the first Great Depression in the United States, the Panic of 1819, as a result. So in every succeeding crisis, financial crisis, the government, state and federal governments have allowed the banks to suspend specie bank payments for the duration of the Depression. This happened in 1819, it happened in 1837, it happened in 1857, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, all the way down to 1933, when Franklin Roosevelt declared a bank holiday as soon as he came in. Now, here we had a great opportunity. Here was the last great opportunity we had in the United States to smash the fractional reserve banking system, to bust it. The whole system was collapsing. The public had finally realized the banks were really bankrupt. So it runs on all the banks. All the banks were caving in. At that point, all the banks could have been smashed. We could have gone immediately without any, without any real hassle. We could have gone right over to a pure gold standard system, 100% gold system, right then. Instead of that, Franklin Roosevelt comes in and saves the banks by declaring a bank holiday, in other words, allowing the banks to continue operation and to get money from their debtors, and yet they themselves don't have to pay a nickel. 
Now, Hoover was going to do the same thing, so we can't blame it only on Roosevelt, because Hoover and Roosevelt were ideological twins, Friedel Lemon and Friedel Leeds. Mike Holliday saved them, and then the thing that finally saved them permanently was the, one of the most monstrous acts of the New Deal, which Milton Friedman is all in favor of, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation system, coming in 1933, which now underwrites all the banks. In other words, the FDIC guarantees the old demand deposit up to, I think, now $20,000. So if a bank goes bankrupt, the FDIC will pay you off. Now, even though the FDIC doesn't have the money, of the hundreds of billions of dollars in deposits outstanding, the FDIC maybe has a couple of billion, and even that's not in cash. It's most not, they don't have six hundred five million. The FDIC has a couple of billion. And that's mostly invested in government bonds. But even though they don't have the money, the wisdom of the public, in a sense, is correct. In other words, the inherent folk wisdom of the public is correct. And that's that they don't have to have the money right now because the government, the Federal Reserve System, can simply print the money and give it to the FDIC, which in turn will give the money to the banks if they want to. They could print $600 billion and give it to the banks. That would save the situation. The Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation has now wiped out the bank run check on the free market bank run limitation on bank credit expansion. So the FDIC has managed to eliminate that. They, even though some widows and orphans and bank depositors are salvaged in the situation, this is at the cost of wiping out, of creating a, a system of potential runaway inflation for the whole, the whole country. So we now, the government has managed to eliminate the runs on the banks because of the FDIC, and also the whole bank holiday or suspension of specie payment tradition. Because you get to the point, you see, when the banks are about ready to collapse and the government says, we can't let the bank collapse. There's too many depositors. It's too important. It's like the current tradition, we can't allow any large corporation to collapse for similar reasons. So this, when this tradition gets in, you have the end of the free enterprise system, the same way at the end of any, any kind of sound banking system uh, with uh, the eliminate bank runs. So the bank run tradition is out, which leaves us with only one free market check remaining so far. I mean, the final free market check, and the first two free market checks, is people not using the bank credit at all. The second check is runs on the banks, in other words, where the clients themselves of the banks lose confidence. The third free market check is non-clients redeeming, calling upon the bank for redemption. Here you have our hypothetical bank, cash a thousand, man deposit five thousand, IOU four thousand. This is the Bank of Brooklyn or whatever, Bank of Northern Michigan, whatever it is. And let's say the clients have perfect confidence in the bank, no problem about bank runs. The clients believe in the bank heart and soul. But what problem here is there are other people around who are not clients of this bank or clients of other banks. Say this is the Bank of Brooklyn, here's the Bank of Queens. Well, some guy might take his $2,000 of his demand deposits and write out a check for a car, pay it to somebody living in Queens who happens to be a, a client of the Bank of Queens. Well, in that case, the Bank of Queens will take this $2,000, pull cool upon this bank here for redemption. We want the $2,000 in cash. And they haven't got the $2,000, they only have $1,000, the bank goes bankrupt. So the final limitation, the most important limitation in practice, was the fact that the bank doesn't have unlimited number of clients. There's other competing banks. If one bank expands its money supply too much, if it lends out a lot of money, creates a lot of money, increases the demand deposits, some of these people will take that money and spend it on clients of other banks. And these other banks might call, will call upon this bank for redemption, this bank will go bankrupt. And it has nothing to do with loss of confidence, it's simply the fact that one bank fans, in other words, uh, at a rate more rapidly than other banks, he's in trouble. The bank is in trouble. Now, this is analogous to David Hume's famous specie flow price mechanism in international trade. In international money, one country expands money too much, either bank money or paper money. If England, say, expands money a lot, if France has not expanded it, but money supply goes up in England, prices go up in England, money will then flow out because French prices are now cheaper than English prices. Money will start flowing from England to France. In other words, people will buy a lot more French goods and French will buy a lot, a lot less English goods because of the high prices. Money will flow out from England to France. England will ha then have a so-called deficit in its balance of payments. France will have a so-called surplus in its balance of payments. And this flow will continue until the two prices are equalized. In other words, until English prices fall, French prices go up until the two prices are equal. In other words, the two price levels of the purchasing power of the, of the gold ounce, let's say, in England and France are the same. So in other words, the check in international trade on any one country's inflation, the big check, is that gold will have to flow out of the banks to the other country, and then the banks have to contract. In other words, if you're building, you have a pyramid. The base of the pyramid is gold. On top of that is, say, paper money of the treasury. On top of that is bank credit. A bank deposit. 
as you expand more, as, as banks expand more and more, or as the government expands more and more, the top of the pyramid keeps going up, prices go up, and then the bottom of the pyramid starts declining as gold flows out, and so the ratio of unsoundness keeps increasing. In other words, 20% will go down to 10%. So the demand deposits go up while cash reserves keep going down, and the banks will finally have to stop this, otherwise they go, go bankrupt, and they contract, and then the whole thing is solved again. Gold flowing out is a method by which the equilibration process in international trade takes place. Eventually, the deficits and balance of payments get cured, so to speak, and the price level is equalized. Well, it's a similar situation here with one bank, you see. This is, this is like a David Hume species flow price mechanism within the country. One bank expands, and it immediately starts losing, can't lose gold so much, because it's supposed you're on a paper currency, you still lose paper, you're losing cash. This bank will start losing cash because its clients will take this new money and spend it on other clients of other banks. And as that happens, the other banks will pull upon this bank for redemption, this bank goes bankrupt. Consider, for example, a polar case here. A polar case would be when every bank has only one client. In other words, extreme competition among banks. Everybody's got his own bank. Of course, it's not very practical, but let's say it happens. I'm a client of one bank, each of you a client of some other bank. With each bank having only one client, no bank could really expand at all, because as soon as I spent any money at all, the other guy would immediately call upon my bank for redemption. This bank expands, expands its credit, say to 4000 I take this $5,000 check, as soon as I spend it, somebody will call upon my bank for redemption. And that's true, there could be a cartel of banks. The banks would all get together and agree to accept each other's notes, so and not call upon each other. That could happen, but it's, it's a flimsy you know, read for bank credit expansion to continue for any length of time. What, so what about this check? Well, this check, this limitation, having a lot of non-clients. Well, first place, this doesn't exist, of course, if you have only one bank. If we had only one bank in the whole country, or, or better still, one bank in the whole world. Every bank, every local bank on the corner was a branch of the bank of the world. Let's say. Then, of course, the bank could expand forever. I mean, it could, it could immediately multiply... 5 to 1, 10 to 1, 20 to 1, and as long as there are no bank runs, uh, which we have ruled out, the bank could just expand merrily forever because uh, no other bank will call upon it for redemption. There's just one monopoly bank. So the more competition there is between banks, the better off we are in this situation. There's more of a check on the bank credit expansion. So knowing this, realizing this, the, the bankers themselves have gotten together, knowing also the cartels in the free market don't work too well anyway, they've gotten together in a put over upon us, just as big business put over upon us government regulation, the guise of being anti-monopolistic, but actually in order to impose monopoly and cartelization on the country. So in the same way, the banks got together and imposed upon us the great progressive tradition or innovation of central banking, which has enabled us to arrive at a situation where the central bank can eliminate any bank calling upon each other for redemption by getting every bank to expand together, uniformly and smoothly together. Supplying reserves and supplying cash so that no bank will get into trouble and everybody can sort of gently and smoothly tow and run away and fight. Just as the regulatory commissions, the ICC and the, and the antitrust laws and all that were put in in order to, to uh, impose monopolization or cartelization on the guise of being anti monopolistic, on the great con job of being anti monopolistic, the solace of the public. So, in a similar way, central banks were sold to the public on the guise of, of restraining bank inflation. We need central banks, the story was, in order to restrict bank credit to keep these vicious, private, greedy, small banks from inflating the currency. Therefore, we need a, a wise governor out there, a central bank, to stop it. So that was the way the central banking was sold to the public. And actual fact was, or the other way around, they put in central banking in order to permit inflation. You know what they, even they call in their own private writings, elasticity of the money supply. For the Federal Reserve System, for example, the money supply was not elastic enough. You know, I think it's a fancy word, meaning it wasn't inflated enough. During the Depression, there was no way to stop pumping money in quickly. Federal Reserve Bank could do that. Central Bank started with the Bank of England, one of the great rackets of all time, the Bank of England, but therefore became immediately hallowed in English tradition as almost equivalent of the Queen and the flag. The Bank of England started in the late 1690s, but we started pretty, pretty late in monetary history, when a Scottish crook named William Patterson uh, a promoter with no money and that sort of stuff comes to the king, the king's always in need of money, right? The people don't like to be taxed. Those days they had a lower boiling point on the tax question <laughs> than we do now. And so the king was very wary about imposing taxes. Here's the Scottish crook, William Patterson, comes to the king and he says, look, here's the way to do it. 
Let me set up a bank, the call the Bank of England, make it a central bank. I haven't got any money, but you, you know, I'll print bank notes, Bank of England notes, and you will accept it. I will give it to the king in exchange for government bonds. The king will write out IOUs. See, then, then king, you can take the money and spend it. You spend it on missiles or whatever the, the uh, 17th century equivalent was, palaces and stuff like that. So the king says it's a great idea. It's a great way to get money. As long as the public can will accept, will be con to accept the Bank of England notes, why not? Great new step forward. Because it didn't look like paper money. Because the banks sounded more respectable. Banks after all were around a lot, a lot earlier than paper money. And this looked like a pretty respectable thing. It looks like a bank note and all that sort of stuff. The public had been inured to it. The king gave the Bank of England all his business. Deposited all of his funds with the, with the bank. Let's say, let's say the, the Bank of England starts off with no money, which is not so far wrong. The bank, quote, buys, unquote, government bonds. The king issues a whole bunch of government bonds. No trick to issuing government Anybody can issue bonds. It's Rothbard bonds. The king issues government bonds. The bank, quote, buys it, unquote, let's say 10,000 pounds worth. So now the, the Bank of England has 10,000 pounds of government bonds in its assets, its vaults, in return for which the Bank of England graciously gives to the king $10,000 of new paper money printed by the Bank of England. So now we have $10,000, and we have bank notes, which is the equivalent of demand deposits. The king goes out and spends it. This is new money. I mean, it's money created out of thin air again. So let's assume that both the king and William Patterson started with no money at all. And both of them looking for some fancy way to get some money. They cook up this scheme. <laughs> the king gives the, William Patterson his bonds. William Patterson gives him prints new bank notes. The king goes out and spends it. And there's inflation. It's inflationary. The king uses a method of taxation and so forth. All the evils of inflation then follow. The point I'm trying to make here is, of course, that the central bank, this has always been what the central bank is doing, and, and the, this con job is still continuing. As a matter of fact, oh, and one more thing the king did for the Bank of England. The king gave to the Bank of England a monopoly of all banknotes within a certain area of London, something like a 50-mile radius or something in London, which means that in the real area where all the trade and finance goes on, only the Bank of England could print banknotes. This is the key to the Bank of England's power and central banking control, because this meant that for Lloyd's Bank, Barclays Bank, or whatever other bank, they no longer issue banknotes, at least near London. They could, let's say, issue deposits, but in order then for the, the customers want cash, they're not allowed to give them cash. They're not allowed to print banknotes. They have to go to the Bank of England to get the banknotes. And this gives the Bank of England its hold on the, on the other banks. We'll see how that works in a minute. So this starts a great central banking tradition. One of the real tragedies is that during the 19th century, when English classical liberalism was triumphant in England, and laissez-faire was coming in, and even hard money theory was coming in, they, even Ricardo was pretty good on the money question. Never really leveled the land, never really smashed the Bank of England, never really was didn't have the guts or didn't have the, didn't want to break the tradition and all that, refused to really do what the Maoists call uh, carrying the thing through to its completion, refused to really smash the Bank of England, left it as a, as a great symbol of national unity, whatever, whatever nonsense. The point is they kept the Bank of England intact, which is, of course, disastrous. The United States had our first, uh, Alexander Hamilton, who, uh, this is, of course, extremely tangential. Alexander Hamilton, I consider the Mephistophelian figure in American history, the, the evil genius American history, put through the first bank in the United States, plus a lot of other things, the tariff and paper money and God knows what else, public debt, federal taxes and the whole business, and the, and the Constitution itself, as a matter of fact. The general welfare clause and you know, the whole business go on and on, but I was in a hammock. Anyway, first bank in the United States comes in, that's the first central bank, but when the Jeffersonians come in, after all, the Jeffersonians were pledged to eliminate the bank in the United States, and they did so. It was eliminated in the Jefferson administration. Then, however, we get into the War of 1812, which the, the Achilles heel in the Jeffersonian program, because as the Jeffersonians were marching on the road to liberty, they suddenly detour on the, on the war, and of course the, all the Federalist stuff, all the status collective stuff comes back in. And part of the thing that comes back in is the Second Bank of the United States. It takes then Andrew Jackson a huge amount of turmoil to get rid of it, and Jackson finally does get rid of it. As part of his program, by the way, to get rid of all fractional reserve banking. Uh, Jackson, and particularly Jacksonian theoreticians, were brilliant monetary theorists. They knew exactly what the banks were about already. They were out to smash them. For one reason or other, you were largely a slavery question. Uh, they didn't do it. At any rate, second central bank attempt smashed by Jackson after a huge fight. Then the, and during the Civil War, the Republican program Civil War, Republicans used the Civil War as a method by which to put in the Hamiltonian program. And uh, part of that program was 
taxing the state banknotes out of existence. So they essentially did was they put a prohibitory tax on all state banknotes. In other words, all banknotes chartered by the states, which meant that only nationally chartered banks did now issue paper money, which was a very small number of banks. So that was the road to perdition. And then the Federal Reserve System was finally put in from 1913. With the Federal Reserve System, we now are caught up with other countries. We now have the beloved central banking system, which we were told by the entire establishment would eliminate inflation, depression, stabilize the price level, <laughs> etc. And of course, as Friedman has pointed out in his historical book, the fluctuations, the inflation, the depression have been much worse since the Federal Reserve System came in than they were before. There's no question about that. But during the 1920s, it was supposed to be the new era, but no more depression, there weren't going to be any more depressions anymore. They all said this in the 1920s. Because the Federal Reserve Banks were out there stabilizing everything and wisely planning the system, and of course comes a big collapse. And you don't hear any more of those people for quite a while. So we now have the, system, the central bank working and manipulating so as to eliminate these individual checks from one bank or another. And that means that the, the only check left, there are no more free market checks or free market limitations on, on bank credit expansion. The only limitation now is the Federal Reserve System itself and its wisdom. In other words, legal or administrative regulations. Which means we have to put all of our trust in the government itself, which is, of course, something which I'm never eager to do. Well, here's the, the mechanism by which the control comes about currently. This is the Federal Reserve System. <clears throat> Cash is now, or reserves are now only, of course, papers. So the gold standard has been abolished in 1933. We now have two sets of banks, basically. There's the commercial bank, so its assets and liabilities column, and then underneath it, we should have the Federal Reserve Banks with their assets and liabilities column. The Federal Reserve Banks are bankers' banks. In other words, Federal Reserve Banks are compulsory banks for the commercial bank. Every commercial bank, first of all, every nationally chartered commercial bank, every state bank, I think, over a certain amount has to be a member of the Federal Reserve System. They don't mind that. I mean, the banks love the Federal Reserve System. It's a sweet compulsion, so to speak. As a matter of fact, the banks put in the Federal Reserve System. These are large banks. Well, the, the, and then the, the other key thing is the Federal Reserve System has a, the Federal Reserve Banks now have a monopoly on all paper money. In other words, whereas before 1913, Chase National Bank and National City Bank issued their own banknotes. So if you wanted cash, if you had a, if you had a checking account in Chase Bank then, you want cash for some reason. You know, you want to pay people in cash. You could go to the Chase Bank and get the Chase Bank banknotes. You know, dollar bills with a Chase Bank stamp on it. Chase Bank insignia, etc. And most people didn't care whether they had Chase Bank notes or federal paper. In 1913, this was made illegal. I mean, the only institution that could supply paper and money to anybody is the Federal Reserve Bank itself. So that means when somebody wants to cash in their bank notes, demand deposits, a checking account is the only, the only liabilities left since bank notes are, have been prohibited, the bank has to go to the Federal Reserve Bank to buy bank notes, basically. This becomes the key to the Federal Reserve control. One, that the banks have to join up, of course, in the Federal Reserve System. But two, even more so, that since they can't issue banknotes on their own hook, they have to go to the Federal Reserve Bank to get banknotes, to buy banknotes by drawing down their own deposits. So what we have is we have people, individual people in the public, with demand deposits, checking accounts with the bank. Well, I'll leave aside savings accounts as being a complication we can't, can't go into here. Well, then there's IOUs, and then there's cash, which now is not so much paper money, but... Demand deposits by the bank at the Federal Reserve Bank. Think of the Federal Reserve Bank as a banker's bank, as a bank which only commercial banks can have their accounts in. So we have reserves which are demand deposits at the Federal Reserve Bank. The bank itself, I mean, commercial bank, Chase Bank, Hand Bank has very little cash on hand, just enough to pay out, you know, hour to hour stuff. There are deposits at the Federal Reserve Bank. There are claims on cash. If they have, they could, in other words, let's say the the bank has a million dollars reserves at the Federal Reserve Bank. This means that the bank, if it wanted to, the Chase Bank, they could go to the Federal Reserve Bank and get a million dollars worth of cash and paper money if they wanted to. So basically, the money is in the reserve account. And then there's IOUs and, and demand deposits. Let's say uh, for 20% again. The Chase Bank has reserves of a million dollars. Demand deposits will then be five million. And IOUs will be four million. So we have the Chase Bank, I mean, multiply the money supply by fivefold. Cash or demand on cash of one million issues four million dollars worth of IOUs, runs out four million, has five million then outstanding, which means it is permitted of money supplied by five to one on its own hook. It's time to look at the balance sheet of the bank on the paper, because they have to have quarterly or something balance sheets. See how much the reserves are, or the cash or reserves in relation to the demand deposits, and also time deposits, and you see the story. 
fractional reserve banking at work. So essentially, the commercial bank has three ma major items in its balance sheet. IOUs, reserves, and demand deposits for the liability. The Federal Reserve Bank has demand deposits owed to the bank. In this case, it will be the same one million. In other words, let's say they have the Chase account. These two will be equal. In other words, the, the reserve account of the commercial bank will be exactly equal to the demand deposit liability account of the Federal Reserve Bank. The same thing. It's a checking account which the, federal, which the banks have at the Federal Reserve Bank. The other big Federal Reserve Bank liability is Federal Reserve notes. In other words, paper money. Almost every dollar of paper money is now a Federal Reserve note. Virtually 100%. Now, this is an interesting thing. This means that a, a Federal Reserve notes are, of course, legal tender. And we have to accept them by law for payment of debts in dollars. They have a monopoly on the name dollar, so to speak. The Federal Reserve Bank, of course, is a very interesting situation. The Federal Reserve Bank is the only institution in the country which every time it prints a, 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 creates a new liability, a new debt, so to speak, it prints new money. In other words, it, it adds to its own money supply at the same time it creates debt. We can't do that, of course. When we issue a debt notice, we issue an IOU, we borrow money or something, we don't print new money uh, at the same time along with it, but the Federal Reserve does. So these are the two basic liabilities, demand deposits to the banks, in other words, bank reserves and Federal Reserve notes. The asset side, Federal Reserve banks have gold, virtually all the gold in the country, or rather gold certificates for the treasury owning the gold, that's really formality. And the rest of it is IOUs. And these are the two basic asset sides. In this situation, supposing eight hundred thousand dollars supposing Christmas time comes and every year at Christmas people want more cash. So they draw down their demand deposits, get more cash, give tips and presents and all that sort of stuff. Well in that situation, here the if, if people want eight hundred thousand dollars worth of cash from the Chase Bank at this point, the reserves are drawn down to 200000 and the demand deposit will be down to $4.2 And now, of course, this bank is in trouble. Its reserve ratio, instead of being 5 to 1, is now 20 to 1. The bank is in bad shape. All right, supposing... Now we have to come up to the, to the, to the final uh, important area of control by the Federal Reserve System. The Federal Reserve System, since all the other market checks are gone on the bank credit expansion, the Federal Reserve now steps in with its own governmental check namely the so-called uh, minimum reserve ratio. In other words, the Congress fixes a certain range of reserve rate, minimum reserve requirement by every bank, and the Federal Reserve can change it at will within that range. In other words, this is the same thing as a maximum ratio of deposits to reserves. Minimum ratio of reserves to deposits, maximum ratio of deposits to reserves. This situation here, if the Chase Bank has reserves of $1 million, and if, say, the maximum ratio is uh, 5 to 1, in other words, if the minimum reserve ratio is 20%, and therefore the maximum deposit ratio is 5 to 1, then it cannot have more than $5 million on a $1 million base. It's prevented by law, or by administrative requirement, from expanding the money supply beyond that amount, beyond this 5 to 1. See, now that it's, it's trouble becomes even deeper if we look at it. People demand cash. If reserves go down to $200 million, it still has, however, demand deposit of $4.2 million, which is 20 to 1. But if the reserve ratio remains at 5 to 1, this bank is bankrupt. The bank has had it. We have the Federal Reserve controlling banking system by the max minimum reserve ratio or maximum deposit ratio. Now, during the Great Depression, the phenomenon of excess reserves came up, which meant that banks were so afraid, because banks were, industries are going bankrupt all over the place, firms are going bankrupt. Banks were so afraid to expand, they didn't even expand whatever, they didn't do, perform the legalized counterfeiting they could perform. And they allowed the reserves to pile up. So they were scared. I mean, they were afraid if they lend the money out, the bank firm would go bankrupt and they bought bonds, the bonds would become worthless. So then they really go bankrupt. They, the reserves pile up. And of course, the Hoover administration, the Roosevelt administration, bitterly attacked the banks for somehow selling out you know, for treason, for not lending out money. Banks loved to lend out money. The point was that there was a bad depression situation. It was obviously in this rather unique situation. They didn't they pile up excess reserves. They were bitterly attacked for it. But barring that, this happens very rarely. Most banks are, quote, fully loaned up, unquote. In other words, they were create new money up to the limit that they're legally allowed to. This is generally the situation, aside from deep depression. One method of control, if the Federal Reserve System wants to, say, pump more money in, the system, they want to create more inflation, which they almost always do, one way they could do it is to lower the reserve requirement from, say, 20% to 18%. This would allow the banks, using the same amount of reserves, to create new money on top of it. That's one way. If, or if they wanted to restrict, if they wanted to have deflation, restrict the amount of inflation, they could increase the reserve requirement and force the banks to contract or you know, not expand more. 
Now, they used to use this weapon fairly frequently, and with great enthusiasm and verve. What happened was, however, in the famous debacle of 1937, when uh, the Federal Reserve System was worried about inflation. As a matter of fact, we had during the 30s, something which has not been recognized, really, the phenomenon of inflationary recession. We had a recession, deep depression, lots of unemployment, yet we had an inflationary boom going on from 1933 to 37. It was a weird situation, it was the first time officially it had happened. As a result of that, the Federal Reserve System got scared and suddenly doubled the reserve requirements. And nowadays, it would be unheard of. It's like it as bizarre as a free market and post office, <laughs> like that. Unheard of situation. They just doubled, I think, from 10% to 20%, just like that. And of course, the banks went back and they, just, they had to contract their loan very, very fast because most banks were fairly well fully loaned up, not, not completely. But they were in a bad state of shortage of reserves, which meant they had to contract very quickly, sell their bonds, call in their loans, etc., etc. And this precipitated a big depression of 38. But after that, the Federal Reserve System has been too scared to, to use this, this instrument with any kind of enthusiasm. Nowadays, they change the minimum reserve requirements of the very, very teeny steps, almost ludicrous degrees, like one quarter of one percent. Sort of like a psychological thing more than anything else. If the Federal Reserve wants to announce to the world they really want to check inflation, they raise the reserve requirement by a quarter of one percent. It's really, boy, it's really terrific. <laughs> I much rather see them double the reserve requirement. And then I they figure they're serious. So really, this instrument has fallen into disuse. It's sort of like, I suppose they consider it overkill. You know, it's like atom bombing some trouble area in, in the ghetto or something like that. It's over a kill, so they don't use it. As a result, this weapon is sort of full into this use. All right. I'd like to try to explain, you know, it's, it's going to be difficult, how the banks right now specifically ban bank credit, even though many of them don't think they do. Uh, it's pretty clear to see how it happens. If we had one monopoly bank, supposing there was only one commercial bank in the country, the Bank of the United States, a private commercial bank, and all other banks in the country were branches of this bank. It's certainly theoretically possible, even though it's obviously not going to happen. Okay, in that situation, and the Federal Reserve Bank imposes a 20%, let's say, reserve requirement on it. Well, supposing its reserves are $1 billion, this demand deposit, you know, the checking account is $5 billion, demand deposit outstanding Federal Reserve Bank would be $1 billion, and its IOUs would be $4 billion. Total money supply, let's say, is $5 billion in the whole country. Supposing the Federal Reserve wants to expand, wants to inflate, as they almost always do. Let's say that by some means they increase, and we'll go into that a little later, how they can control total reserves. By some means they increase total reserves. They get more reserves into the hands of the virtual bank. Well, I don't think it goes up to two billion. I'll take, make it really rugged. We can see what happens. Take the unusual hypothesis. The Federal Reserve prints more money out, prints cash, and gives it to the, to the bank in the United States. One billion dollars more. And unmarked bills. <laughs> By through Herbert Kumbach or somebody in the dead of night. <laughs> they get they get a billion dollars. What are they going to do with it? Boy, oh boy, it's a bonanza. The, the official reserve requirement is only 20%. They now have 40%. What they do is they simply go out and they create more demand deposits. They go out and they say, hey, they go to General Motors, they go to John Blow store, they say, wouldn't you like some more loans to give you a really cheap credit? Because now they can create more money again. They're no longer fully loaned up. And they say, hey, that's terrific. Only 4% instead of 8%. Great. And whatever. And they now shovel out, they increase demand deposits to 10 billion out of thin air, create new money out of thin air, new fraudulent demand deposits, warehouse receipts, and now have $8 billion in IOUs. And everything is hunky-dory. We are now fully loaned up. This is an immediate situation. Actually, this would be, in a sense, this would be a healthier situation than there is now, but it's easy to understand. Even the bankers themselves couldn't con themselves into believing they weren't really creating new money. It's pretty obvious what they were doing. Be, they got $1 billion more new reserves, and they pump in $4 billion more loans, and they got $5 billion more in demand deposits. The current situation, however, when you have competing banks, more cloudy, more complicated, and every banker can con himself into thinking he's not really expanding money supply. He's really only borrowing money from one set of people and lending it out to another set. And it works something like this. Here we have a bunch of banks, A, B, C, D, that are all fully loaned up, competing banks. And supposing here's Bank A has reserves of, let's say reserves of $1 billion, the man deposits $5 billion. Some way... The Federal Reserve goes in the debt of night, gives a new, a new billion dollar bag to Bank A, and they have a billion dollars more new reserves. It's now up to two billion, and now I have two billion dollars, let's say plus a billion, one billion dollar more in reserves. Let's say they give a demand deposit, they give Combox or whoever a billion dollars on a deposit, and they now have a billion dollars new reserves, a billion dollars, only a billion dollars new demand deposit because they can now expand by four to one. Now Bank A can't do that exactly all at once. They can't just create a $4 billion new or more demand deposit and lend it out to General Motors or John Blow. So if they do that, Bank B or Bank C, etc., 
I mean, General Motors or John Bell will buy equipment or pay workers or something. They'll be clients of different banks, and they'll call upon Bank A for redemption. They'd be going bankrupt because if they print four billion more, in quotes, and they now have five billion dollars of more demand deposits, what happens if banks B, C, and D call upon them for the four billion? They only have one billion. They will go bankrupt. So they can't do that. They can't expand, in other words, by the full four billion right away, or by the full five billion demand deposits. What they can do, let's assume is a 20% reserve requirement, instead of expanding by 5 to 1 right away, they expand by 80%. Instead of creating this bonanza of $5 billion and more demand deposits, they create $800 million. And now they have an increase of $1.8 billion demand deposits. IOUs are now plus $0.8 billion. And they're assuming now, the worst case, they're assuming that pretty soon, sure enough, excuse me, $0.8 billion. 0.8 billion is going to be called upon this redemption, 80%. Sure enough, it happens in a few weeks, or whatever. General Motors spends its money on equipment, and the equipment manufacturer happens to be a client of Bank B. They call upon Bank A for redeeming the 800 million. They have the 800 million. They have enough because they have new reserves of a billion. They can pay out the, the billion. They now have the reserves are now increased by only 200 million. And they're now all set. They have demand deposits. This goes down also by 800 million because that's the Joe Blows or whatever, you know, supplier's bank. And now the demand deposits are again up by uh, a billion. And the reserves are up by 200 million. They're all set. They've expanded the money supply by their 800 million. They're out of the picture. They, they now have new reserves of 800 million. So we now have plus 800 million IOUs, plus 200 million in reserves, and plus 1 billion demand deposits. Bank A is out of the picture. However, what it has done is it has contributed $800 million or more reserves, which will now go into Bank B's pocket. Bank B now has cash of $800 million. It has reserves on the Federal Reserve System of $800 million. In other words, its reserves are now going up by $800 million. And its demand deposit, the supplier of General Motors has a uh, demand deposit checking account of $800 million. So it's plus $800 million now, and plus $800 million demand deposit. What we have here, notice what's happened. Bank A started as plus a billion reserves, plus a billion demand deposits. It winds up with plus a billion demand deposits, plus 200 million reserves, and the other 800 million reserves have been spread out. It spread the reserves, it shifted the reserves to another bank. Okay, the same thing happens to the other bank, except with 80% of the previous one, 20% less now. It lends out 640 million. In other words, it can create not five times as much money, but 80% more money than it has. Yet it cons itself into thinking it's only lending out 80% of the money it took in. Except the point is the money it took in is pyramiding on top of the other money. It's really increasing its money by 80%. This is a situation now of 100% reserve banking, at least for the new money, and now it lends out 80%. It lends out 640 to John Smith Grocer, and now has an IOU of 640. It increases demand deposits from 800 to 1440, 1440 million. 600 million, 640 million has been created out of thin air. It now has an IOU of 640, which it charges interest. 640, however, as soon as it gets shifted around to somebody else, let's say the guy who produces the counters, cash registers, say, for Joe Smith's grocery store, he's, let's say, a client of Bank C. Of course, he could be a client of Bank A, but that's even better for the bank. Now, bank C calls upon Bank B for the 640 million. Bank B pays up and has the money because it's only expanded by 80%. So he's been prudent enough to expand the money supply by only 80%. Reserves are now going up by 160. Demand deposits are going up by 800, and Bank B is out of the picture with, and now Bank C again has 640 new reserves, and it increases some more by 80% of that, which is something like 512 or something, and et cetera, et cetera. The result of this whole process is $1 billion more in demand deposits of Bank A, $800 million more in Bank B, $640 million in Bank C, et cetera, et cetera, until you, until you wind up with $5 billion altogether in new money. It takes longer, but the final effect is the same. Because due to the, the reserve system, the fact that all these banks, as members of the Federal Reserve System, are all regulated by it, we have a system whereby competing banks don't really mean anything anymore. It could just as well be one bank. And be even better, because then we could see clearly that the bank is expanding money supply out of thin air. This process is so arcane and so confusing that even the bankers themselves often don't know what they're doing. And when I first studied economics, my first class in economics in college, the professor said the bankers know less about money than anybody else in the system, in the, in the economy. I thought he was crazy at the time, and I now see that he was really right. Either that, of course, or they're totally evil. This arcane process, you can work it out yourself in a diagram, you know, how this thing works. The final result is this five to one. Total demand deposits are going up by five billion, reserves are going up by one billion. 
So therefore, the key, since the reserve requirement thing isn't changing anymore, the key to Federal Reserve control of the banks is controlling total reserves, this item here, total reserves in the bank. The Federal Reserve can manipulate total reserves. If total reserves go up by $1 billion, demand deposits, checking account goes up by $5 billion. The ratio right now ranges from 14 or something to 17% for different classes of banks, or something like 6 to 1, but the principle is the same. So therefore, the key instrument by which the Federal Reserve System manipulates the money supply, usually, of course, increasing it, is by increasing total bank reserves. How about the Federal Reserve reserves? Is there any limitation on the Federal Reserve System increasing total reserves? Not anymore. It used to be. If we go back again to these two diagrams with the commercial banks, on top, assets and liabilities, and Federal Reserve Bank, bottom, assets and liabilities. Supposing we have our billion and five billion, to use it as a useful amount. Let's assume a commercial bank has a reserves of one billion. Uh, that's their demand deposits of Federal Reserve Bank. Demand deposits of five billion, and IOUs of four billion. They're in great shape. Uh, they've inflated by five times their, their amount. But they're in great shape financially because they, they're within the 20% ratio, legal ratio. In the meantime, the Federal Reserve System now has demand deposits owed to Federal Reserve Bank one billion, so it's the same as this amount here. Then they have Federal Reserve notes, in other words, paper money. Let's say there's another billion in paper money outstanding. So now we have one billion in paper and one billion in demand deposits. And gold is in the asset column of Federal Reserve Bank is gold. Let's say gold is 200 million. And the rest of it, the rest of the two billion is made up by IOUs. We'll see in a minute what they are, of 1.8 billion. So the key then becomes, how does the Federal Reserve control the man deposits? There's no limitation on it. In the old days, it used to be. It used to be a requirement when the Federal Reserve System first came in, in order not to add to the inflationary worries of the public, to calm their fears, there was a requirement, I think, no less than 40% reserve requirement of gold for the Federal Reserve System, reserve banks themselves, of gold to Federal Reserve notes, and 35% of gold to the man deposits. That's a pretty high requirement. It means the Federal Reserve cannot inflate more than two and a half or three times on top of its gold. It cannot inflate its own liabilities upon which the commercial banks inflate. Remember the pyramid. Gold on the bottom, Federal Reserve on top of that, and commercial banks on top of that. Each one is related to the other. These to be a fairly severe three to one, two and a half to one requirement on the Federal Reserve System. It was progressively weakened over the years by Congress and now there's no requirement whatsoever. It's zilch. The Federal Reserve can inflate 200 million times on top of the gold supply. There's nothing to stop it. So we're now totally in the hands of the Federal Reserve governors. The, the wisdom and, and brilliance of the Federal Reserve system are uh, now running, uh, running us all. So what, does the Federal Reserve, what instruments does the Federal Reserve have to manipulate total reserve? Well, first place, there are other influences on total reserve. One of them I mentioned already, people demanding cash. This can embarrass total reserve can, and decrease it. Federal Reserve, however, has the instrument to offset that and also add more on top of it. And what are these instruments? Well, two basic ones uh, have been talked about in the past. One is lending money, you know, lending reserves to the banks. Very simple. It's something like the <laughs> giving the money in a paper bank, but we lend them the money in a paper bank. Lend them reserves, that's all. Bank is in trouble here, needs $200 million of reserves fast, because people are calling upon the banks for redemption. People can still call upon the banks for redemption, though. So they can they, they do that, it embarrasses the bank. They need $200 million more, and... Federal Reserve simply lends them. The reserves are now up to 1.2 billion. They can expand another billion on top of that in great shape. And then, of course, they have to pay back the Federal Reserve when their trial is over, but that can work that out. So that's simply lending the reserves. It's easy to see what happens there. Now, the, the publicity is usually gotten by the Federal Reserve lending operations. For example, when the Federal Reserve, Federal Reserve can lend reserves to commercial banks. In the 19th century, when banks were collapsing a lot, it was a real pleasure, Walter Badgett, as far as I'm concerned, one of the most overrated political theorists and economists in the history of the world. Anyway, you know, Walter Badgett, beloved by almost every historian, for some obscure reason. His name is kind of like a spell, a typical English thing, a spell, had no relation to the pronunciation. It was spelled B A G E H O T. Pronounced Badgett. You know, you have a piece of information you didn't know before. <laughs> so Badgett issued this pronunciamento that banks, the central bank, is morally obligated to bail out all banks in times of trouble. Very convenient. Pronunciamento, and the banks, of course, took to it like a duck took to water, and then it's been established in monetary theory ever since that the banks, that somehow there's a God-given law that the central bank must bail out the banks. This is called the theory of the bank as the central bank as the lender of last resort. In other words, when the banks are really in trouble, there's always the godfather over there, the central bank can come in and bail the banks out. Okay, so that was established. It was established then, 
the Federal Reserve had to always bail out the banks. They always had to stand ready to lend money to what, any, any bank, regardless of how, what bad shape and how crooked or whatever the bank was. But however, the Reserve Bank could charge interest. They could change the interest rate. They could stand ready to lend, but they could lend at a punitively high interest rate. So a lot of publicity has been focused on the financial pages on the, on the rediscount rate, as it's called. But in other words, the rate that the Federal Reserve Banks charge the commercial banks for lending them reserve and interest rate. It's called the rediscount rate. Every once in a while, when the, when the Federal Reserve wants to announce that it's really against inflation, it raises the rediscount rate by a quarter of one percent, a big deal. If it wants to inflate, it lowers it. But really, this is, again, this is really baloney. It's really a psychological value rather than anything important. First place, the banks aren't that much in debt to the Federal Reserve Bank. So that's not really a very important mechanism anymore. Also, the banks have created a very this typical sort of way the market pops up in different areas. The banks are created by themselves, market in bank reserves. If one bank gets out of line, it's below 20%, let's say. Another bank is a little bit above 20%. The below bank borrows the reserves for a couple of months in the surplus bank. It's called the federal funds market. And they borrowed a certain interest rate. This has almost wiped out federal reserve loans to the banks. So that instrument is really out. It gets a lot of publicity, but it's really not worth anything. The real mechanism by which the Federal Reserve Banks manipulate total reserves and thereby manipulate money supply is as follows. Here's the Federal Reserve Bank. Here we have the 1, 4, you know, 1.2, 1, 4, 5, etc. And here we have the Federal Reserve Bank. Federal Reserve Bank, let's say, wants to inflate, wants badly to inflate. It wants to inflate by our old friend $1 billion. How does it go about doing it? And thereby increase the money supply by $5 billion. In other words, doubling the money supply in our example. The way it does it is it buys an asset. It doesn't matter what it buys. It's the important thing because it gets very confusing at this point. The important thing is it can buy any asset it wants. It, it can go out and spend a billion dollars on my old portfolio, which is worth about you know, 25 cents. They might, however, love me so much. You know, I might have a blackmail thing on them or something like that. They, they spend a billion dollars on my portfolio. It doesn't matter what they spend. They can buy old houses. They can buy paper clips for a billion dollars. They can buy old dirt. It doesn't really make a difference. All they have to do is to go out and buy something and pay a check on it. That's all that's necessary. Say they buy my old portfolio for a billion dollars. Let's take a really bizarre example like that. In that situation, uh, they buy me out, sell out the total reserve for a billion dollars. <laughs> sell my portfolio, which is worth about a quarter of a billion dollars. All right. Federal Reserve Asset Column Portfolio, one billion dollars. <laughs> They value it at a billion. I mean, they bought it at a billion. Who, who is anybody to say them nay? All right. Now, I'm not challenging them. It could really be a billion dollars worth of it. They pay for that by writing out a check of a billion dollars. Now, I can't do anything in a check. A check says, pay to the order of Marianne Rothbard, one billion dollars, sign Federal Reserve Bank in New York. What can I do with it? I am going to account of Federal Reserve Bank in New York. I go to my bank, my commercial bank, let's say Chase Manhattan. I deposit it with great glee at Chase Manhattan. My bank account goes up, in other words, demand deposits by Chase Manhattan go up uh, from five billion to six billion. Demand deposits of the banking system go up from five to six. But Chase Manhattan is even more gleeful about it than I am. I'm only getting a billion dollars. Chase is getting a billion dollars worth of reserves on which the banking system can pyramid five to one. Five billion, never mind the one billion. So the Chase Manhattan runs as fast as their little legs can carry them to the Federal Reserve Bank in New York, causes the check, and the Federal Reserve Bank in New York gets an increase in its reserves. So after all, that's why the Federal Reserve Bank is the banker's bank. They have now $2 billion of reserves. The man deposits outstanding of the Federal Reserve Bank is now $2 billion. Notice that all balances. We now have the first set of balance here. We have the commercial banks, IOUs, $4 billion, reserves, $2 billion. The man deposits, $6 billion. So that balances. And in the Federal Reserve account, we have portfolio now. We've added a portfolio of $1 billion to the assets. And portfolio means not that bond, it means my portfolio <laughs> of $1 billion. So we've added another billion dollars to demand deposits out of the commercial banks. It's not the end of it, of course. What happens now is the banks go into a complete cat fit here of joy, and they expand by five to one. Either if Chase is a monopoly, they expand right away. If it's competing banks, as it is now, it takes them a little bit more time. But we wind up then, $2 billion of reserves, we wind up with demand deposits not of $6 billion, but of $10 billion. And I owe you with eight billion, and we now have expanded the money. So we've doubled the money supply from five to ten billion. Just by the Federal Reserve Bank buying my old portfolio for a billion dollars. I say it doesn't matter what they buy. What they buy is unimportant. The important thing is what they pay out. They pay out a check. And as soon as they pay out a check, this mechanism goes into effect of quintupling the money supply. In practice, of course, they don't buy my old portfolio. <laughs> Too blatant. Too blatant. <laughs> and they don't buy old houses and all that. What they buy is government bonds. 
the U.S. government bonds, they buy old government bonds, and we know now is a drive on to allow them to buy new ones. They buy old government bonds. It's not important that they buy old government bonds. It's important for the bond market, but it's not that crucial. The crucial thing here is they buy a billion dollars worth of government bonds. The bond dealers rush out, take the check, Federal Reserve Bank, deposit them in their commercial bank, Chase Bank, let's say. They get an increase in their demand deposits. Chase gets an increase in its reserves, and they can now quintuple their money supply. That's the process by which it happens. The process is called open market operations by Federal Reserve Bank, or open market purchases. Usually the sales are very few and far between. <laughs> sales is when the Federal Reserve sells bonds. Then, of course, you have the reverse situation. When the Federal Reserve Bank disgorges some of these bonds, then people buy it. I write out a check. Let's say I buy a, a government bond of a billion dollars. I write out a check on my bank. My bank loses reserves, and the banking system has to contract. That's the other side of the coin. That's called open market sales. So in other words, in practice, instead of this portfolio thing, the IOUs here, the 1.8 billion, are government, U.S. government securities. And over the years, of course, the Federal Reserve, which started with zero government securities, now have billions and billions of them. I don't know what the figures are, but they're enormous, because every year they're piling on more. So in other words, the way in which the federal government increases money supply year after year by approximately 10%, give or take a bit, is by the Federal Reserve Bank going out in the open market and buying government bonds. Seemingly harmless operation, done continually with almost no publicity. Financial pages are not you know, publicized every time the Federal Reserve buys bonds. It's you know, like a normal thing every day. And there's a federal open market committee which meets, I think, once a week and decides how much to buy and all that jazz. But the point is that the, the upshot of all this thing is this is the way in which Money supply is regulated and inflated. The Federal Reserve feels that this, New York is inflating too much beyond Boston. There might be some problem with Boston banks calling upon New York banks for redemption. They just shovel all bond buying at the Boston market and they're equalizing the situation. So the whole the economy, all the banks can inflate beautifully together. But not too much calling upon redemption of one bank upon another bank. Because if everybody's inflating together, you know, the, the amount that Chase calls upon National City for redemption will be more or less offset by the amount that National City calls on Chase for redemption. They can clear it and nothing, nothing happens. The one check here on the one limitation on Federal Reserve in this balance sheet, Federal Reserve expansion, is of course gold. The fact that the Federal Reserve used to have to pay their, their liabilities in gold on the gold standard. Well, that of course was eliminated. First it was eliminated very gradually by the governments and by establishment, by spreading the cultural value around it. It's really like the old geezer who didn't want to have his money in the bank. Because the other old geezer, or the same old geezer, doesn't want to have, wants to have his money in gold. You know, carry gold around. This is considered Neanderthal, it's considered ridiculous, it's considered there are lots of stories about crazy old geezer who wants to have his money in gold. Why does he have his money in paper or bank credits? It's more comfortable, it's uh, lighter in weight and all that sort of stuff. And so, the idea of people actually using gold coins in day-to-day -day transactions was gradually laughed out of court. People stopped using it more and more. And more and more, gold was confined to, to bars or bullion in international transactions, large-scale transactions. This meant, this is extremely important, because this meant that it was easy then for the government to abolish the gold standard. If the public really had really been using gold day-to-day -day in 1933, and all their transactions, they fight all the gold pieces and everything else, then there would have been enormous outcry, this confiscation. But nobody was hardly using it at all except for presents of their kids. We got to the point, you see, where the, the average person only used gold coins at Christmas time. They, they give the kid a gold coin and the kid's stock. Santa Claus deposits the gold coin. That was about it. It was really sort of like a toy for most people. And so then it was easy for the government to confiscate it, which they did in 1933, the Black Day in 1933. Because of the so-called Depression Emergency, the government confiscated the gold and ingested them into the hordes of Fort Knox. Supposed to be only for the brief emergencies until the banks were cleared up again, until the bank holiday was over and the banks were in good shape. The banks were in good shape very shortly thereafter. The depression was over you know, several years thereafter. And of course, the gold has not yet been siphoned back into the public coffers. Here we are, uh, 35 years approximately since the depression. There ain't no gold anymore. And the gold has not been paid back to us by our government. Uh, in other words, the government confiscated the gold. Incidentally, just as sort of a piquant note here, Favorite character in American history is uh, Samuel Chase, who was the secretary, who was a Jacksonian hard money man, who was secretary of treasury during the Civil War, the Union side, printed the greenbacks, which later inflated. And then when the, several years after the Civil War, the case comes before the Supreme Court, were these greenbacks constitutional? Was it legal for the government to issue a paper money at all? I'm not even talking about irredeemable paper after, I'm talking about just paper money irredeemable at the time, even. Uh, greenback. Was it legal? And the Supreme Court decided four to three, I believe, or two vacancies on the court. 
Florida Free was unconstitutional. So for a few glorious years, paper money, irredeemable paper money was unconstitutional. Uh, Chief Justice Chase wrote the decision, which made his own action as the Secretary of the Treasury illegal and unconstitutional. It's a beautiful, uh, probably unique act in the history of the world, denouncing himself for, uh, for this evil paper money, inflationary paper money. Okay, what happened was, and this is, I think, a piquant, interesting note, is that the uh, President Grant, who was in the pay of the, the Watergate types of the time, the uh, <laughs> inflationary government subsidized types, then I pointed to the two vacancies in the Supreme Court, two gentlemen, I think Bradley and somebody else, both of whom turned out to be lawyers for the big railroads, and both of whom then, when the, when the decision was re-argued a couple of years later, argued on the pro-paper money side, and the decision was reversed by five to four. Uh, the reason why the railroad lawyer thing becomes important is because the railroads are heavily in debt. Railroads were the great bond issuers of the time. And of course, bondholders, debtors, bond issuers, rather, like to have inflation because this wipes out the uh, purchasing power of the money they have to pay back. So the railroad connection then becomes the interesting touch why paper money then became legitimated. At any rate, then we wind up in 1933 with gold being confiscated. And so the, the way by which this legalized money counterfeiting takes place now is through this Federal Reserve purchases of bonds. Another pecan touch, remember I talked about the Bank of England and William Patterson. We have a similar thing with government deficits. The government, let's say, has a deficit. Well, let's say it has a deficit of $10 billion. How does it finance it? Well, there are three ways it can finance it, or any combination of these three ways. One way is to just print the $10 billion, the old-fashioned method, printing the paper money and spending it. Now, this would mean that we have a $10 billion deficit. If it's simply a financial deficit, let's say its revenue is $30 billion and its expenditures are $40 billion, or whatever, however it gets to the $10 billion. Method number one of financing the, the, the deficit is by printing the money. Print the old greenbacks, the continentals, and you print the $10 billion and spend it. Now, of course, this is inflationary. We can say that this $10 billion worth of inflation has been injected into the system. Prices will go up accordingly. On the other hand, there's something sort of lovable about this method because it's clear and honest. I mean, in the sense that there it is. I mean, everybody knows you printed the $10 billion. Everybody knows that's inflationary, and that's it. Okay, that's one method. Second method... <coughs> Financing the deficit is borrowing money from the public. In other words, government issues bonds and sells it to you and I and Nelson Rockefeller and whoever else buys them. So, borrowing from the public. Now, this method of selling $10 billion worth of bonds to the public is not inflationary at all because it doesn't increase the money supply at all. The first method increases the money supply by $10 billion. So, that's inflation. That's bad. Second method is non inflationary because we, we reduce our bank de deposits. You, I, and us and Rockefeller reduce our bank deposits by $10 billion, and the bank deposits get turned over to the Treasury Department, and the Treasury takes the money and spends it on missiles, paper clips, and other productive things. <laughs> and that's it. The money circulates, and get, the resources get shifted from hi-fi sets of paper clips and missiles, and missiles but it's not inflationary. It has other bad things wrong with it. It shifts money from private hands to public hands, but at least it's not inflationary. However, the bad thing here, aside from these, this shift of resources, is that then... The government has to pay back the ten billion to bondholders plus interest. On the interest, whatever, depending on what the interest is, we now have a lot more. In other words, over the years, the government, let's say, has to pay back twenty billion. So we have taxes go up by twenty billion. So the second method of borrowing from the public is lovably non-inflationary. On the other hand, it's not so lovable that have to the taxes go up by approximately twice the amount of the previous inflation. Taxpayers have to pay now and in the future, on and on, for the next twenty years or so, for this debt. Now we have a third method, which is the method generally used, and the method most sophisticated, most beloved by uh, sophisticated establishment economics. That is, you finance the deficit by borrowing money from the banking system. Then this is the equivalent of the king financing his deficit, his personal deficit, by borrowing money from William Patterson. Borrow money from the banking system. When you do that, you increase the money supply by $10 billion the same way, because what happens is, we now have, we look at the bank's commercial banks, assets and liabilities, you now have demand deposits go up by $10 billion. In other words, the banks create $10 billion of new money, new demand deposits. They, they hand over to the government, Treasury Department, and it spends the money on paper, funds, missiles, etc. In return for that, the banks get, the IOUs now, government bonds, in short, $10 billion. So in other words, the money supply is going up by $10 billion through the issuance of more bank money. So we have inflation, $10 billion worth of inflation on method three. However, 
In addition to the $10 billion worth of inflation which we suffer from printing press, the old-fashioned printing press method, we now have to pay the banks back, in quotes, to the tune of $20 billion. In other words, taxes go up by $20 billion in order to pay off the principal and the interest of the government bonds for the next 20 years. Method three, which is the dominant method, of course, is a method which we suffer the worst of both worlds. We both have inflation and increased taxes. So taxes go up, taxes increase by $20 billion. I know this is sort of a moral situation here, or the moral dimension of this system. <laughs> we, the taxpayer, we, the American taxpayer, are paying the banks both the principal and the hefty interest rate for the dubious service of inflating the money supply, which they themselves benefit from. Look at many ethical systems, or ethical principles, is kind of a bizarre system. It's bad enough to have the banks inflating, it's, it's even worse to have the taxpayer gratefully paying them back, in quotes. See, Paul Cotter, of paying them back, assumes that they save their own money up, or they borrow money from other people, and have these, the money, the capital, is saved up by the small savers over the country, and this is invested in government bonds, and the, and the commitment to pay them back. The banks, remember, created new money, and then bought the bonds with the newly created checkbook money. All right, we're borrowing from the banking system. We're combining the worst of both methods, and I say this is the dominant, this is the dominant method. This is the, the modern, sophisticated equivalent of the, of the king borrowing from William Patterson, and both are making this deal, and William Patterson is getting money, King is getting money, they both wind up with lots of money. It's the same way here with the government and the banks. You might ask the question, how, how do the banks get the $10 billion to buy the government bonds with, because they're all previously fully loaned up? Well, the way they get it is the Federal Reserve Banks help out by pumping $1 billion worth of reserves into the system. $2 billion, the ratio of 20%. Pumping in $2 billion, and thereby giving the banks the $10 billion to spend, so to speak, or enabling them to increase by $8 billion more. So we have reserves going up by $2 billion. This is done by the Federal Reserve Banks buying $2 billion worth of old bonds in the open market. This completes this complicated chain. The Treasury wants to borrow $10 billion on inflate to finance the deficit. The Federal Reserve Banks go into the open market, buy $2 billion worth of old government bonds, old existing government bonds, thereby increasingly paying out checks, $2 billion worth of checks which old bond dealers get, and the old bond dealers take this money and they deposit it in their bank, their banks get $2 billion worth of more reserves, the banks inflate $10 billion on top of that, and they inflate by buying $10 billion worth of new bonds issued by the government, the Treasury, to finance their deficit. By this complicated process, we wind up with $10 billion worth of inflation and something like $20 billion worth of new taxes over, over the years. Uh, okay, so, so this more or less is the, the monetary inflationary mechanism going on. Now the question is, is the final point of the course is to talk about uh, one, of the, one of the effects of this inflationary process, which we don't think much about. In addition to the increase in prices going about through inflation, in addition to the possible or probable runaway inflation eventually, there's another effect of increase of bank credit, which is to generate the dread and famous business cycle, which brings us to our final topic, the business cycle. And obviously, it's sort of ludicrous. Uh, I go through the entire business cycle process in about a half hour, but I'll try to do my best. In the old days, in other words, in the day before approximately 1750, that's what I mean right now by the old days, there were bad times of business, hard times, I guess we were cool. Once in a while, but what happened is that these hard times were pretty evident, it was pretty evident what the cause was. In other words, the course of business, if you want to sum it up in sort of a very oversimplified fashion, would be going along fairly smoothly and then bingo, there'd be a big collapse. Sudden collapse. Usually this would happen because the king, say, would suddenly confiscate all the money in the country. All the merchants would get confiscated. The king needed money fast. He'd confiscate the merchants, grab all their gold away. This would cause a depression. It's pretty obvious. Or a specific events or a war would take place, and trade would get shut off. One of the last famous cases of this was during the Civil War, American Civil War. Britain's major industry was cotton textiles, and they were dependent on their major supplier of cotton was the American South. And comes the Civil War, and they were, the cotton supply was cut off, so the British cotton industry goes into depression, Britain goes into depression. It's obvious why. I don't need any sophisticated business cycle theory to figure it out. This is the sort of depressions that would take place before approximately 1750 where you can easily pinpoint the cause. Anybody who has any sense and knows the scene, knows what the score was, and usually it's the government. All right. Then what happens is that approximately 1750, there occurs a phenomenon in the Western world, in the, any sort of developed mar market economy, a dread phenomenon whereby you have a seemingly regular alternation of booms and busts, the so-called business cycle or trade cycle, where 
business will sort of go up and then collapse suddenly and then go up again and so forth and so on. You have some, some kind of a cycle, a right? phenomenon. So as this became evident, an economist began, of course, to try to explore it. As economists, as the profession of economics comes up, or as people think about economic problems, to try to figure out what the cause of this whole thing was. It's certainly not obvious. It shouldn't happen. If you look at it from the point of view of micro theory, everything should be sort of hunky dory. The market's always clear. There's always full employment or tendency toward it. So what's the matter? What's this, this boom and bust business? As a matter of fact, Ford Keynes, in his, probably the worst chapter in that book, General Theory, wrote a historical chapter of about five pages or something. He said that for him, nobody ever thought about business cycles. So the people we call the classical economists didn't even consider those a problem. Didn't think of such things as unemployment or crises or bankruptcies. And only he has come along and uh, get, to give us give us a theory of unemployment and depression. Of course, this was not the case at all. The people, the economists, have been thinking about business cycles for many years, if not decades. Okay, so so what's the cause of the first place the, the economists wanted mostly to investigate the crash? They weren't really concerned about the boom of it. You know, the, well, why is there a crash? Why is there a sudden panic? Why is it this, on one day the stock market collapses and banks collapse? The so-called panic or the so-called crisis this is the most evident, dramatic, and disturbing event. And for a while there, it so happened about every 10 years there was a big crisis. So there was a theory of periodicity where the idea was it was some kind of periodic cycle every 9.8 years. And the, some economists attributed the sunspots. There's a whole thing on that. This has fortunately been forgotten. So anyway, and it turned out it wasn't periodic, it wasn't 9.8 years, and that's what it went down in the drain. So what you have is a series of booms and busts which are not periodic, but keep going anyway, keep alternating. Now there have been two kinds of explanations of the cause of this business cycle. One is the dominant explanation now for many years is the idea that, well, the dominant type of explanation is that the cause is somehow deep within the Industrial Revolution. It all comes about because of the Industrial Revolution and the market economy. There's something within the processes of the industrial system that bring about a boom and bust cycle. And since most people don't like a boom and bust cycle and consider it evil, therefore there's something evil about the market or something evil about the industrial system. And in one way or the other, the Keynesian system, the Marxian system, etc., etc., all come under this rubric of blaming the Industrial Revolution or blaming the market even if they don't have any specific uh, causal explanation, they'll still say, well, it's something within the market, or something in the industrial revolution. And therefore, usually the conclusion is the government has to step in and do something about it. Either abolish the market, or regulate it, or whatever. So another system, another group of theories of explaining the business cycle, which has been almost forgotten until fairly recently, which used to be dominant in the 19th century, which essentially says, no, it's not the free market, it's not the Industrial Revolution, which comes about around the mid-18th century. Something else which came about in the mid-18th century, which is the real cause, comes about, in other words, at the same time, approximately, the Industrial Revolution, that's the rise of commercial banking, the rise, in other words, of fractional reserve banking. Now, this process, which is obviously not a market process, which intervenes in the market, either by the banks themselves or by the government or a combination, that this is the worm of the apple. That without the monetary intervention, in the market, not the fractional reserve banking, we wouldn't have the boom and bust cycle. Now basically, as the little one Mises, I think, was the first one to really point out, the David Hume species flow price mechanism is really the first primitive business cycle model. In other words, if you look at it, remember I talked about England and France, and England inflates and so forth and so on. England, in the English banks, at the behest of the English government, inflate. English prices go up. And then what happens is that Gold flows out from France to England. Uh, there's a deficit in the English balance of payments. There's a surplus in the French balance of payments. And then finally, the, the pyramiding effect of the bank, bank notes or bank deposits on top of gold becomes so top-heavy, and banks are obviously in such bad shape, they have to contract. And as they contract, there's a recession, prices fall, and bankruptcies, and gold stops flowing out and starts flowing back again. This is a, a one-shot model of business cycle. In other words, there's an inflation brought about by the bank, bank credit expansion, prices go up, there's a feeling of prosperity and exhilaration, etc., etc. And finally, there's a contraction because gold is falling out, and then the banks collapse, etc., etc. Then you have the boom bust cycle. The next question is, of course, why does the boom start up again? Why isn't it just a one shot thing? And then the reason, of course, as Mises pointed out, is because the banks are inherently inflationary, inherently want to create money, and the government joins them. As soon as they get the chance, they start inflating again. As soon as there's been a, 
the banks have reestablished their credibility, as we now say. And we're off again on the other cycle, and the boom bust cycle continues on. Now, that I think is a pretty good explanation. It's not sufficient. It became known as the purely monetary theory of the business cycle, which the Friedmanites have essentially brought back in this kind of weird kind of way. Uh, weird in the sense that the Ricardians, Ricardo and his school, had the, the initial theory of the uh, monetary theory of business cycle. Their view was, therefore, you shouldn't inflate. Therefore, you should have hard money of pure gold standard or whatever, and don't inflate. Because they, what they want to do is not to have the boom-bust cycle. On the other hand, the Friedmanites being interested largely in stabilizing the price level and realizing that prices will tend to fall as the supply of goods and services increases with productivity, therefore want to pump in more money in order to offset the general tendency toward a falling price level. So it's a very different kind of situation. But the emphasis on a purely monetary explanation of the business cycle is still there. So what Mises contributed, uh, Mises and Hayek uh, following him, contributed to the theory of business cycle, so-called Austrian theory of business cycle, to which I am here, is joining with this another strand to this monetary explanation. Namely, that when the banks increase, when they expand credit, when they expand the money supply, they're also doing something else in addition to being inflationary. They're also lowering the interest rate below the free market level and pouring that money, that new money, into basically into new business loans. In other words, they're mostly lending money not to the consumers but to businessmen to invest more. And in doing that, they're causing overinvestment in the so-called higher orders of production, or so-called uh, in the remote orders of capital and goods. And they're, they're causing, in other words, an overinvestment in capital goods and an underinvestment in consumer goods. They're causing too much resources to be invested in, say, uh, nails and, and cement and construction, and too little in clothing and hi-fi sets and whatever. And the result, this distorts the production structure. And as the as inflationary process continues, as the credit expansion continues, the distortion piles up more and more, necessitating a final reshift, uh, a shifting back of resources. This shifting back is essentially the depression or, or the recession. Uh, for example, it's going to be very rough to try to explain in a few minutes. This is the magnificent Austrian theory of the structure of production. Essentially, I guess, in this hinted at by Karl Menger, the founder of the Austrian school, developed in great detail by von Bawerk, the great leader of the Austrian school, and finally by Hayek, applied to the business cycles by Hayek, uh, the student of Lily von Mises. Uh, essentially what you have, consider uh, consumers are spending a certain amount of money, uh, a bar, the length of the bar being the amount they spend. Let's say the consumers spend $200 billion a year on retail products. So this is consumption. So money is, money is going from consumers to the retail seller, retailers. So here's $2 billion, $200 billion going from the consumers to the retailer. Let's, say, let's make it $100 billion, make it simpler. $100 billion going from consumers to retailers, over, let's say over a year or a month, it doesn't really matter what time period. And goods and services are going from the retailer to the people, consumers. Okay, retailers take a certain amount of that. They take a certain amount of that $100 billion and spend it on their own payment of wages to uh, people working in the retail industry, rents to landlords in the retail industry, and profits, and interest rate. So then there are a certain amount of payments to factors of production in that industry, let's say $10 billion worth. So $10 billion goes up the ceiling here where there's factor payments. $90 billion, let's say, goes to the wholesalers. And $10 billion goes off to the, to the factors of production in that industry. $90 billion goes to the wholesalers. And then the same thing happens to the wholesalers. $10 billion, let's say, gets paid out to the land, labor, and capital and entrepreneurs in the wholesale industry. Another 80 billion go to the jobbers, another 10 billion up here, and 80 billion goes to the jobbers, and 70 billion manufacturers, etc., etc. So what you have, in other words, is a structure of production. At each stage of production, every time the money is turned over, every time you're going up the stage of production, more money gets hived off. You wind up with something like this with a, with a step by a triangular effect, with all the 100 billion being paid out in factors. And then all these guys taking 100 billion and spending it on consumption again, roughly, and you have this, this is known as now in the textbooks as a circular flow, except it's not really circular, it's really more like oval. And also the, the usual textbook analysis ignores the, all these stages, it just has a lump of producers and a lump of consumers. And what happens is as, as the capitalist system advances and gets more productive and more capital equipment, the, the number of stages of production increases. So you have a, what I calls a lengthening of the structure of production. As saving and investment increase, when I say the number of stages of the structure of production lengthens, and without going into the whole analysis of all the triangles, under credit expansion, too much gets 
invested in the higher orders of production. It's too much stuff in construction. These are called the higher orders. Again, these are consumer goods of lower orders. Too much gets invested up here, not enough down here. Resources are bid up into these areas. Land, labor, and capital are shifted into these areas. And there's too much invested there. And then, what happens is, when they, let's say people build the new dams and the new construction projects, and the businessmen have get the get the money for construction projects, pay them out to the workers. These workers take the money and they spend it on consumer goods. They, they, they haven't increased their savings at all. Their savings are still, let's say, the old proportion, the old 10% of their income. If not 20% as, as would have to be to validate the new investments. So they reestablish their old consumption proportions. And as they do that, these industries out, out here collapse. These industries in the higher orders of production collapse. The structure of production shortens again in order to satisfy the consumers in the best possible way, in order, in order to satisfy the time preference of consumers. So what the credit expansion does, it violates the time preference of consumers. In other words, consumers have a certain time preference structure. They assume a certain amount on current goods. They save and invest a certain amount for future goods. Credit expansion, bank credit expansion, inflationary money supply into the business loans makes it appear as if there's a lot more savings available for future investment when there really isn't. Makes it appear as if time preference is a lot lower than it really is, and so too much is invested in these remote orders of production. So then the question is, okay, if consumers then reestablish their old proportion, why doesn't the business cycle come to an end in a couple of months? You know, as soon as the producers, business men pay out the money and, and the workers start spending it, the whole thing should be over in a couple of months. Why does the business cycle last about several years, four, five, six, seven, eight years? Well, the reason is, the reason why the boom continues is precisely because more bank credit is being poured in. In other words, the bank credit expansion is not a one-shot thing, it's a continuous thing. And it's a process by which the business system is allowed to remain one step ahead of retribution. In other words, the, the overinvestment, the calling to account, the calling to judgment of overinvestment is constantly being postponed by the fact that new bank credit is being poured in. And so this thing is, is one step ahead of, of the workers reestablishing their own proportions. This is now often called a liquidity crisis, a liquidity crunch. It turns out businessmen don't have enough money anymore. And this simply means that bank credit isn't expanding fast enough in these situations to validate these, uh, this overinvestment. When bank credit expansion stops, then this whole process goes into effect, a shortening process, and workers get unemployed in these areas, there's a fall in prices in the, in the capital goods industry, as a reestablishment of the old orders of production. So, according to the uh, Austrian theory of business cycle, the recession is not simply a result of contraction of the money supply. The recession becomes inevitable and healthy once there's a boom. In other words, the, the boom is the bad thing. The boom distorts production process distorts it, uh, in ways different from what the consumers want. And the recession is the process by which, the painful but necessary process by which the free market restores the proper production structure in relation to the time preference of consumers. Session then becomes inevitable and a good thing, in quotes, in relation to the boom. Therefore, the policy conclusion, of course, is the exact opposite of the current the Keynesian and post-Keynesian policy conclusion. Keynesian policy conclusion is, for various reasons, we haven't got a chance to go into Keynesian theory, for various reasons it is, if there's a recession, pump more money in, pump more spending in, inflate, secure it. The Austrian theory, the first of all, if there's an inflation, stop inflating, stop increasing money supply, stop pouring more bank credit in, and then if there's a recession, don't do anything about it. Keep the government's hands off, thus allowing the adjustment process to proceed as fast as possible and wipe this whole thing out, because the government interferes in the adjustment process by propping up wage rates or propping up lending money to unsound businesses, etc., or it does it postpones the business cycle, it lengthens the depression, it postpones the adjustment process, and keeps the economy in a state of sort of chronic depression as it did in the 1930s. The thing to do is to leave the process alone and let it adjust as fast as possible. Usually these recessions are very fast, even if they're very deep. For example, in 1921, there was a recession in response to the big post-war boom, 1914. And it's a very sharp recession. Prices fall about a third or 40 percent or something like that. But the recession, the whole recession was over in about nine months. When the government leaves them alone, there's a free market uh, attitude toward recessions, in other words. Uh, they're over very, very quickly. You can hardly know that they're there. It's only when the government steps in to, quote, cure them, unquote, that they're prolonged and almost rendered permanent. And the only other thing that culture can do, so to speak, to, to speed up the adjustment process and alleviate the depression is, in contrast to the Keynesian system of trying to get people to spend more, you know, spend more and thereby pump the, climb the pump, obviously the, the culture should be doing it to alleviate the depression is to encourage people to save more. The more they save and the less they consume during recessions, the faster the recession will be cured, because the more these investments will no longer be excessive and now be validated by 
genuine shifts in time preference. If these if these are genuine shifts, of course. The more you get people to save and invest, the more thrifty you get them to be, the more, less painful a recession will be. And of course, the more capitalized, etc., the structure will be. Just the exact reverse of the Keynesian prescription. This explanation, by the way, is, accounts for every boom bust cycle since 1750, even before that, in localized cases. 1929 depression is a beautiful example of Austrian theory at work, uh, I mean, Austrian analysis of the situation at work. Most people think of the 1920s as a great era of laissez faire in the United States. It was not an area of laissez faire, especially in the area of money and banking where the Federal Reserve System had been established. The Federal Reserve System was deliberately inflating the money supply and expanding bank credit for various reasons in order to help Britain, was the usual uh, argument. Because Britain was inflating rapidly in those days, as usual, and we had to inflate in order to not allow Britain, uh, not put the pressure of Britain of losing a lot of gold to us. Because if we want to fight at about the same proportion as Britain did, they wouldn't lose much gold to us. Actually, the situation is even more sinister than that. Since the both the Federal Reserve System in the 20s and the Bank of England was essentially run by the Morgan interests, uh, but that's another really another story. And then we have the, the phenomenon of inflationary recession is explained by the Austrian theory because during a depression period, what happens is the prices of capital goods, prices of construction goods, wage rates in these industries are supposed to fall, and prices of consumer goods industry are supposed to rise, thereby inducing resources to shift back from the uh, construction of capital goods to consumer goods. So there always is a rise in, in consumer goods industry during depressions. In other words, say during the 1929 depression, oil prices fell, but the prices of capital goods and the prices of construction machine tools fell much faster than the prices of consumer goods, much more rather. They would fall, let's say, by 50% in the construction industry and by 20% in the retail industry. What happened in old depressions, classic depressions, was oil prices would fall, and then capital goods would fall a lot more than consumer goods. So this meant that consumer goods really went up relative in price relative to other products. But nobody cared about that because the consumers, because the one good thing about an old-fashioned depression is one good thing, one good thing alone, and that is you can enjoy a nice fall in your consumer prices. My parents were best off their whole lives in the Great Depression because since they were employed, and most, most people I'm were employed, everything was a great bargain. Furniture was very cheap, houses were cheap, everything was terrific. So that was the one good thing about depression. Now they've taken that away from us because they, <laughs> instead of allowing a deflation <laughs> of bank credit, <laughs> because in every, in every classic uh, depression, banks would have to contract their credit and oil prices would fall as a result. Now, of course, they don't allow any bank credit contraction ever, so prices are never allowed to fall again, and therefore, this healthy de deflation is eliminated, and we now have all we have is a rise in consumer goods prices relative to other prices, which means that, you know, since the price is going up, and money supply is inflating rather than deflating, we now suffer during a recession from a rise in consumer goods prices. In other words, we now have the worst of both worlds. We have a, the bankruptcy, unemployment, and all the rest of it is associated with recession. We also have what's classically associated with an inflation, which is rise in prices. Now, the Keynesians can't meet this thing because the Keynesians' whole theory rests on the dichotomy that when you have two abysses, it's a function of the government to steer the car, so to speak, across this tightrope of an abyss on either side. One is the abyss of inflation, the other is the abyss of unemployment. But since we're having both, then what do you do? And of course, the Keynesians have no, no answer whatsoever for this. The Freeman and I don't have any answer either. And so we wind up with none of the establishment economists knowing what to do about the current situation when there's this whole series of inflationary recessions punctuated by runaway inflation in between, or increasingly runaway inflation in between. Only the Austrian theory really can explain the solution and explain the situation and also come up with a solution. The solution essentially being get the government out of the whole business, which is really, I guess, the, uh, the lesson and the moral of the whole, whole course. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>